ladies and gentlemen, welcome um, and welcome to the first uh, CMGH and uh, Global uh, uh, Grand Rounds for this new academic year. I am Dennis Ferretti. I'm the uh, director of the Center for Multicultural and Global Health here at uh, the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. I'm also the associate director for the Global Surgery Institute um, also here at UT. And uh, today it gives me really, you know, great uh, honor, pleasure, privilege to welcome a very good friend, Dr. Alan Tita. Dr. Alan Tita is based at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, and he's an, uh, uh, a specialist in um, obstetrics and gynecology in maternal fetal medicine and perinatal um, epidemiology. Um, Alan has pretty much spent um, uh, most of his uh, faculty time at the University of Alabama, and today uh, Dr. Tita is the uh, Senior Associate Dean uh, for Global and Women's Health at, at the uh, University of Alabama uh, uh, College of uh, School of Medicine. He is um, the John C. Holt MD Endowed Professor of OBGYN. He's the Vice Chair for Research and the Director for the Center for Women's Reproductive Health. Um, he um, is also the Director of the newly created um, UAB Institute for Global for Global Health. So he wears a whole lot of, of, of titles um, and I uh, really marvel at how he does all of it. Um, Dr. Tita is a very prolific researcher, researcher with multiple, multiple grants um, that he's um, PI, um, PI of, uh, multiple NIH grants and uh, sits on um, different NIH um, sections. His background is, um, is in maternal fetal medicine. He continuously leads and designs uh, multiple collaborative um, uh, studies, um, various clinical trials, observational studies that influence practice and policy globally, such as the optimal timing of cesarean section at term and the use of adjunctive azithromycin for cesarean delivery prophylaxis. He is also the lead of the Cameroon Health Initiative at UAB, uh, which is a multidisciplinary venture to improve healthcare in collaboration with Cameroon partners. Um, he serves on multiple boards. And so today it is really a great honor, of, um, Alan, to welcome you. And we look forward to, to, to your talk. Um, over. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ferreira, uh, Dennis. I really appreciate the uh, invitation. Um, this is sort of coming full circle uh, for me uh, because. Um, I actually, uh, like Dennis, I'm a native of Cameroon, and that's where I went to medical school and uh, started uh, traveling. Um, uh, I'll come back to some of this, but you know, my time here in the U.S. has been mainly focused on uh, domestic U.S. national uh, work around uh, pregnancy and uh, uh, child uh, health. And uh, I think we've been able uh, through the, we've been very fortunate to have the resources around here and to be in the right place at the right time with the full support to be able to do uh, what I think uh, has been um, uh, having some impact in the sense of doing things that have led to uh, uh, a change in practice uh, guidelines uh, nationally and, and by extension. Uh, internationally, uh, but it gives me a uh, really great pride to be able to say it's coming full circle to get to now uh, focus on global health work and help others and cheer on others uh, who do this work. So though the title, um, let me go ahead and share my slide, says it's, uh, you know, lessons learned. It's an ongoing uh, learning, and I look forward to having enough time for us to have a discussion and um, so that others can share their own experiences uh, in this area. Let me go ahead and share, make sure you can see my slide. Set. Is that good? All right, great, thank you. So I wanna start with where we are right now. Um, right now, um, uh, uh, frankly, or just before I, I, uh, we, we came to 2015, I came to UAB in 2005 as a fellow. 
Um, at the time, one of the things that brought me here was the fact that there was a very vibrant global health uh, uh, activity and global health initiative here at UAB. Um, primarily uh, uh, out of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology that I was going to join and based in, uh, in Zambia. But through some of the complications that can occur as global health work is done, uh, uh, some of the key partners uh, as part of that initiative moved on to another uh, institution. So the work that we did out of the School of Medicine uh, prior to 2015 was just everyone in their own area developing their, their interest, you know, me from Cameroon, working in Cameroon, others working in other uh, countries. Then in 2015, as part of the vision of a new dean, uh, Dr. Selwyn Vickers, who is a surgeon and has been dean um, for somewhat almost 10 years here, um, he thought global health was a very important uh, uh, part of uh, what the School of Medicine could do and came up with a global health initiative in 2015. And there were some leaders who worked on this with the goal to just uh, fulfill the mission of service, research, and education in strategically selected international uh, settings and to develop a stable, reliable, consistent platform for global health work. And so this loop was really looking us, looking at, okay, where can we uh, you know, go to work and not necessarily looking at the perspective of our partners and how they uh, interact with us. But uh, great work, great momentum uh, occurred. And uh, so in 2021, uh, so last year, I was appointed to be the Dean of uh, Associate Dean for Global Health. And so it became uh, my job to make sure that uh, this work uh, continues. So one of the things uh, we did was to uh, talk to uh, some of the uh, stakeholders in this. We put out a survey and ask uh, our School of Medicine faculty, researchers and trainees about where they work. And we found that they worked in at least 38 different countries. And so this is, uh, not everyone responded. So this is an underestimate, 38 different countries uh, outside of the, uh, of the US. So not only in low and medium income countries, but in high income uh, uh, countries as well. But as you can see a great preponderance in low uh, income uh, countries. And then we also ask them, what kind of work uh, do you do? And you can see a good representation here of the different uh, missions that we all want to serve, education, service, research, uh, clinical. So clinical and uh, service then, you know, obviously an overlap and then uh, education and capacity building an overlap there, but a good uh, distribution of uh, those uh, different uh, areas. And so, you know, you can see uh, here, just we found uh, service ranging from uh, direct clinical care, plastic surgery in Central uh, America, neurosurgery in Vietnam, telehealth support for various uh, disciplines, um, community health workers work in South Africa, um, and really contributing to a lot of work around uh, guidelines and different uh, other areas, some of them doing bi-directional work around emergency medicine in OBGYN with some of the work we were doing, pediatrics, uh, uh, medicine, and neurology. So all of these things going on, everyone in their own area, so still um, not very uh, coordinated. And uh, we talk to people and ask them, how can we help? And I think, uh, you know, those of you who do uh, any kind of academic work, it's not just restricted to global health uh, work. Uh, some of these uh, challenges are, uh, you know, uh, cross-cutting. So people wanted to hear things about or help around identifying funding opportunities, uh, providing mentorship for uh, uh, research, uh, providing reviews for uh, grants that would go in, providing pilot funding to generate uh, preliminary information and uh, uh, set up uh, the appropriate infrastructure or, or partnerships to do more impactful uh, things. Uh, we heard about administrative support, pre-award, post-award, IRB, all of those things, um, taking on another dimension of challenge when you uh, even move beyond national boundaries to do work uh, in international, internationally, and then questions around travel logistics. So we just wanted to get a, 
you know, see where people uh, felt the challenges were, get a, uh, a view of the landscape as uh, part of this. And so the other thing that, uh, you know, we did as we came on was to talk to a number of global health uh, leaders and also, you know, looked at some of the global health uh, literature. We talked to people out of uh, the Gates Foundation. We talked to uh, people out of McMaster where they have a vibrant uh, global health uh, program as, uh, in partnership with several other uh, countries, including the University of Maastricht um, as well. And there were some themes that were recurrent. And these are some of the, those themes. Obviously, the connectedness of all populations and Obviously, in 2021, at the time, and obviously, and still going on, COVID-19 could not. There could be no better example than COVID-19 to just show how interconnected we we uh, we are. But also uh, highlighting the need for equity and mutual respect. When you look at things around how vaccines were handled, some people had them, and others, you know, uh, did not have. Obviously, there was. Uh, the question as to whether uh, if you, if we brought vaccines to certain areas, would people actually use them? But on the face of it, um, some people had a lot while others, um, you know, did not. So just equity, mutual respect. And then there has been this whole concept of uh, uh, colonization of global health. Uh, the landscape of global health is really, was felt was really, um, mirroring the colonial dispensation of people coming in, taking over, defining what the priorities are, um, et cetera. And over the years, there have been a lot of discussion and ongoing discussion about how to roll this back. And if you roll that back, do you actually cause harm uh, to, to global health? Uh, but there were some uh, statements that really resonated with me that as we partner with people, the initiatives that we offer uh, should uh, offer equal or greater benefit to our partners. And that leadership opportunities should also uh, be available to our partners. So when we write a paper, is it all populated by uh, people who are based out here? Because we know uh, right, we, we believe we know we, we can, or do we actually provide opportunities to bring up people and have those papers reflect a true collaboration? Um, there's also this uh, concept around nothing about us without us. So really uh, working with the local communities and partners and governments, when governments, whenever uh, possible, uh, sometimes we've found that nonprofit organizations, NGOs, church-based church organizations can be very effective, but working with them and letting them lead on those priorities for that uh, uh, local uh, setting. And then the other one that uh, at, was recurring was just things have to be bi or multidirectional and transdisciplinary in global health. Global health is not public health. Um, uh, global health is not um, uh, just uh, somebody, uh, an OBGYN, for example, sitting in their space, just doing, you know, what they can, can you link up with pediatrics? Can you link up with the community workers? Can you link up with, um, you know, policy makers, et cetera? So it's really lots of uh, engineers, lots of people um, making up global health. And then also, is it always our trainees going out to the international uh, low, uh, low income setting? Do we create opportunities for them to, uh, our partners to also come and learn and also teach us something as we go, um, you know, and also learn and teach something. So it has to be um, multi-directional. And so that question always resonated, uh, how can global partners participate meaningfully in the work that we do uh, together? I just wanted to briefly, again, highlight some of the challenges we faced with COVID-19 where we've lost ground, right? I mean, those resources have been uh, moved towards 
uh, fighting uh, COVID-19, um, affecting health systems, affecting the economy. We all, I think, can understand the erosion of trust in, uh, you know, the, in, and misinformation that's out there um, and, and more questioning of vaccines, questioning of other interventions and treatments. And, um, and this also continues to highlight the question of uh, ongoing question of global health uh, colonialism and resources that may have been available to move things along may be uh, less available. But, it, but COVID-19 also reinforces the need for global health. It really provides that justification because we cannot uh, just live in silos and what happens in one setting uh, automatically can affect uh, uh, what may be a perceived faraway uh, setting. So finally, we looked at the money and uh, kind of just queried where uh, 2015, when the Global Health Initiative started, about 45 million uh, per year in uh, uh, international grants and contracts coming to this uh, School of Medicine by 2021 with a little bit of organization um, at the time about 68 million. So uh, our goal then is to plan and do things that continue to build uh, up on this to a better organization. And so we transitioned from an initiative um, to an institute, so I took on June uh, 2021, uh, but prior to that, during the, the, the year prior to that, had been working with the Dean and working to uh, get this uh, philanthropic initiative uh, come up and Dr. Manix Hearson, who is based here in Alabama and is an eye uh, uh, surgeon with a really large, uh, uh, vibrant eye practice uh, in, in many uh, places. Um, made the transformational decision to name our school of medicine and uh, with funds up to a, about a hundred million dollars. Uh, so the school of medicine was named and uh, the Institute of Global Health was also named um, after his wife and brought us some seed funding about five million dollars to boost and catalyze the global health um, work and so uh, the School of Medicine also invested in that, and uh, and that's what is giving us the opportunity to move, continue to drive global health uh, forward here at UAB. And so we set up an overarching goal uh, that would be to improve uh, health and well-being and promote equity in health outcomes among people around the world. We wanted to have more coordination and be more comprehensive and have uh, think about sustainability and have. Uh, things be multi-directional, um, addressing education, uh, research, and also uh, uh, services and mutually beneficial capacity uh, building and identifying priority problems to uh, work on. And also underscore the need for whatever we do to be transdisciplinary and look at multiple aspects. So we came up with just three initial strategic uh, goals. Um, one, just to promote global health scholarship and develop scholars in global health. We, in partnership and as part of the uh, naming donation, there was an encouragement to work with McMaster University and an already established global health consortium. But we, one of the things we set out to do was to start a master's of science in global health program which would underpin a number of global health opportunities as we develop scholars. You could have dual uh, MD, MS in global health programs. You could have fellowship uh, programs uh, that, uh, you know, in global health where the uh, fellows after their basic MD and postgraduate training can also obtain, get a master's um, in global health as they, uh, you know, continue along uh, their uh, education. And then also uh, uh, through this co scholars program, look at how we develop faculty members and how we develop uh, trainees through fellowships or concentrations and electives at both the residency uh, or medical uh, school uh, level. So those two bullets go uh, hand in glove. And the next uh, goal to promote a multinational research service and capacity building initiative in global health where 
uh, with our partners, some of those 38 countries will be prioritized and have a, a, a what cross-cutting uh, mission approach. So education, comprehensive in terms of education, training and research, and have that as a platform where we can do a lot of things to move uh, global health uh, forward, whether it's doing research to test uh, various solutions and strategies for priority global health problems. Um, and we're in the process of talk, uh, talking with NIH on what I, I would consider would be a major global health uh, trial around peripatum cardiomyopathy, which is a major cause of death um, postpartum in this country, but also affects uh, uh, Blacks predominantly. And there is a promising intervention that has not been well tested. And so we hope to really, and we're putting together centers across the globe and NIH is very interested in working with us to um, uh, you know, uh, move this towards an intervention in multiple countries. The other area we are very interested in is telehealth services. And we do appoint, we appointed a task force to, uh, that is working to develop a telehealth uh, strategy. And then uh, finally, to do something around promoting health information and appropriate health information, which may be related to travel, uh, related to pandemics, uh, et cetera, or just related to fighting uh, misinformation. The third thing really captured, how do we do this? Uh, by nucleating global health in the School of Medicine and have uh, appropriate representation. So we set up a steering committee and ask all the department chairs to appoint uh, representatives. So there are some vice chairs who are, uh, you know, uh, vice chairs in global health. There are some who are associate chairs in global health. There are some who are divisional um, leaders, but this committee meets on uh, every other month to help move the global health agenda uh, forward. And some department chairs actually appointed themselves to be part of it. So there is that. Uh, Enthusiasm. We've provided pilot funding um, to move forward uh, the areas that we uh, want to uh, promote, and I envisage a pilot funding to move uh, telehealth uh, forward, and then set up a framework to provide intellectual and logistical support for grants and uh, program coordination. We're making a strong drive to have fellows, um, you know, fellowship uh, programs, and so have that uh, coordinated through the institute and then uh, doing seminars and symposia. Uh, with everything, it needs a team. So we rapidly put together a team. This is our global health team. And very importantly, working to get an associate dean, uh, I'm sorry, an assistant dean, an associate director we are hiring um, for that position, because this will be key in leading that uh, 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 postgraduate or master's program and a future PhD program, and also making sure that those educational uh, scholar uh, programs uh, uh, move on uh, with a good uh, footing. So the task is great, and uh, but together we can do this. And this is uh, borrowed from one of our collaborators in Cameroon, who uh, uh, is, is a director of a major, in fact, the, the, the largest non-governmental healthcare infrastructure in Cameroon. And, and the mentor um, who came to Cameroon and they worked together to build uh, a really great system there that we are partnering uh, with to do some of the work we are doing. So at this point, I just wanted to you know, move on and say a few things about some of the uh, work that the, our teams are doing out in different places. Um, there may be, uh, I'm sure, similar uh, experiences uh, here and I hope we have a conversation. So one is Zambia where we are part of the uh, NICHD Global Network for Women's and Children's uh, Research. Um, this is a huge NIH funded network in seven countries, three in Africa, uh, three in Asia, and one in, um, in Latin America. And we are actually leading a trial in this network that is looking at reducing maternal and neonatal sepsis and deaths, and also looking uh, using an intervention, uh, antibiotic azithromycin, and doing some uh, with Gates Foundation support, 
some work around uh, genomics, antimicrobial resistance, resistome, um, et cetera. The, the sample size for this is 34,000, and this uh, network is hitting about 29,000 now. So this is going to be a very um, important uh, study that I think will be published in the next uh, year or so. Um, there have been other uh, work done out of this global network, uh, one that had to do with essential newborn care and resuscitation and really changed the landscape for what WHO recommended around newborn res resuscitation. Uh, prior to this, newborn uh, babies, fresh stillbirths were just let, you know, assumed to be stillbirth, but this study demonstrated that you could have a huge impact by doing reanimation because some of those babies just needed a push to, um, you know, uh, get their breath and uh, ultimately uh, do well. So this led to a huge reduction in perinatal uh, mortality. A lot of other work going on there, uh, NIH funded, led by others um, around childhood uh, uh, development and also cervical cancer prevention. I think one of the largest cervical cancer prevention programs is uh, out of Zambia, has CDC funding as an uh, attachment to what is going on around HIV prevention and it's um, uh, those uh, partners have uh, UAB affiliations. So this is an example of a meeting that we had when we were launching the global network uh, study, people from uh, all uh, seven countries, uh, NIH represented, RTI, and myself and Wally Carlo is a, uh, the pediatrician on, uh, from UAB, who is the PI of the global network. And, uh, uh, and we'll, we look forward to these uh, findings. South Africa, we have a great uh, relationship with uh, what is called the African Health Research Institute. And we actually have faculty who are based there working and uh, doing a tremendous work around uh, 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 tuberculosis uh, prevention and, uh, and treatment. And this is where they are based in Durban, uh, but also doing work that goes up to uh, uh, Johannesburg. Two faculty members, uh, Emily Wong and Andrew Stern, highly successful around uh, TB work, recently awarded them a pilot uh, grant to be able to bring trainees as well. Train people locally, but also bring trainees from UAB to continue to build uh, the expertise, not just on TB alone, but also to uh, gain things around leadership related to project and research uh, development. Emily Wong was one of a few who just got a prestigious Bureau Welcome uh, Award uh, that has to do with um, being an investigator around the pathogenesis of uh, infections. And so those are the universities that they collaborate uh, with. I'm not going to dwell much on the long program, but it's a huge infrastructure and great collaborations with the Gates Foundation and funding. Uh, from others. Uh, they are probably one of the leading um, TB programs in the world. Then uh, emergency medicine here also has a global health uh, program that has to do a lot with uh, training. Uh, their goal overall is to improve delivery of acute care and emergency medicine in low and medium income countries uh, through education. Uh, primarily, but also to uh, partnerships and research. And they have different types of fellowship programs. Some one-year fellowship in international emergency medicine and global health. Um, they, they take what is called the GOGAS course, which is based in Peru with strong UAB affiliation. It's an internationally renowned uh, course. I'm going to talk about that uh, some. Can also do a two-year uh, fellowship that has to do with uh, again, emergency medicine, but also ultrasound related to uh, emergencies. And then another two-year combined fellowship in social uh, emergency medicine and uh, global health, leveraging other global health resources uh, available. They do do some projects um, uh, shown here, uh, but their work has been mainly around uh, education and uh, a good footprint with a presence in different countries where they uh, uh, go to work. And then this one is dear to me is the Cameroon Health uh, Initiative um, at UAB that we co-founded um, here. 
um, with another one of my uh, uh, colleagues and a long-standing productive collaboration has been going on since 2008, but has grown uh, uh, during that time uh, between faculties and leaders in Cameroon and UAB with the goal to improve health of women and children through research service and uh, training. We partner with the Cameroon Baptist Convention Health Services, which is this huge uh, uh, NGO health organization and the University of Boya, which is the only Anglo-Saxon university in uh, uh, Cameroon, which is officially bilingual. And we have a huge team uh, present in multiple facilities uh, there, uh, different backgrounds, and we have NIH funded uh, work uh, going on. And this picture sort of shows some of our UAB partners and local partners uh, there on a trip. Um, this is the Dean of the School of uh, Medicine out in uh, Boya, Dr. Hale Ekane. This is uh, Pius T, who's just been a transformative figure in, in leading that Cameroon Baptist Convention Health uh, Services. This is our program, Kai, Kai UAB program coordinator uh, based there. And these are other UAB partners, um, uh, director of the uh, center, uh, Sparkman Center for Global Health. I'll say a little bit about that here at UAB. This is my other colleague who does a lot of the NIH uh, funded work there, Dr. Jody John Odom. So it takes a team and several years of work uh, to get to this. And the main university, we're uh, working on a memorandum of understanding and having a meeting with them just to highlight those handshakes and being present and communicating is really essential to keep these relationships uh, going. This lady is called the Iron Lady, uh, was the uh, what they call the vice chancellor, sort of the president of the uh, university um, at the time, and is currently a minister um, in, in Cameroon. And we have our other partners here and other leaders of the university. So briefly about some of the work we do in Cameroon, we started with pilot projects. About uh, 2016 or so, I went to the chair, chairman of OBGYN and said, we need some money to invest and see what happens. And, uh, secured $20,000 and we gave uh, pilot funds to, to 2000 each and made a requirement that this pilot fund should be led by a, a, a trainee or junior faculty member locally in Cameroon who is partnered with somebody here, uh, a faculty member there and with somebody uh, here as a faculty member at UAB as well as a potential trainee. And so, uh, you know, about $12,000 into this, we were able to start getting some NIH uh, funding. So I would say about up to 20,000 already is, uh, brought in about $6 million in uh, funding within, uh, you know, several years, about six years or so. And uh, this uh, premise was a K23 for Dr. Dion Odom, looking at uh, strategies to optimize prevention of malaria in pregnant um, women. Revert B is a uh, new strategy to evaluate how to use antivirals to prevent transmission of hepatitis B uh, to uh, the kids of women who have hepatitis B, sort of mirroring what has happened with uh, HIV. And then uh, this is a study that we did in Cameroon with Merck for Mothers uh, funding that was a precursor to the large uh, azithromycin trial that we are currently leading in the global uh, network and showed some promising uh, results. And then we are currently also, this is one that I'm co-leading with two other PIs, um, using what is called uh, an mHealth approach to medical information service via telephone. We collaborated locally to set up the system and have uh, people, women, uh, workers in very remote locations who may be taking care of pregnant women be able to call and get help from someone with more advanced knowledge. And then if necessary, escalate it to an expert pediatrician or OBGYN, um, all of them based in Cameroon. So sort of the natural uh, extension to this would be if, you know, um, we from this end were able to provide some additional uh, consultation. And then uh, training and service, we have a global health fellowship out of OBGYN that's open. We have opportunities for MD and PhD trainees, um, uh, both are here at UAB, but also from Cameroon. And we've had some exchanges that way 
we support an advanced life support program in obstetrics. We've set up their, uh, their database and my program, the program, our program manager in Cameroon actually leads that. And this is like emergency care for obstetrics, which trains, provides training uh, to workers from any uh, service in Cameroon. There's an NIH for Gadi now, and we have two postdocs in Cameroon who are funded through this uh, mechanism for the next year uh, to gain advanced research uh, training. And then we have an elective opportunity in Cameroon that is open to any OBGYN resident in the country. Um, they, uh, our residents go there and then other residents can apply uh, to go. Even from uh, Tennessee, your residents can go if the, uh, if, uh, and uh, once they get there, our partners take care of everything local. All they have to do is to be able to get there and then everything, food and board, et cetera, is uh, provided. So this is the local team investing in um, you know, the partnership as well, because I feel we, we tend to send third or fourth year residents who already have a tremendous wealth of knowledge um, to be able to impact uh, pregnancy care. Uh, obstetricians and gynecologists are very rare in that setting. Huge cervical cancer program going on. And this is Dr. Simon Manga, who has served three years here as a postdoc and is one of our D43 uh, postdocs. And we appointed him as an instructor here and gave him the option whether he wanted to fully join here or uh, stay in Cameroon. And he is staying in Cameroon and has been appointed a deputy director of that Cameroon Baptist Convention Health Services. So we're very proud. It's very productive and, um, and, and, and sort of proud about being helping to set the next generation of leaders uh, for that uh, system. It does a lot of work around uh, cervical cancer prevention. Uganda also going on improving maternal and child health for women and families. And this is just uh, to show uh, Dr. Lynn uh, Matthews. Here is my associate director for research and partnerships. And this is her main collaborator in Uganda. And these are some of the uh, teams they work with uh, all levels, students, postdocs, et cetera, and really doing a lot of work to build local uh, uh, capacity. Lots of projects going on around STI, family health, uh, uh, funded work, and I'm not gonna just uh, dwell on each one of them, but just to show uh, the level of activity that's uh, going on with some of these collaborations. I talked about the uh, Gogas Global Health, and tropical medicine uh, opportunity. They have a fellowship uh, there. And what Gogas does is a really uh, immersed uh, training in uh, at the Gogas Institute for Tropical Medicine. So it's focused around uh, tropical uh, medicine and really uh, closely infectious uh, diseases. And they have uh, many different uh, offerings uh, to anyone, uh, but strong UAB affiliation and uh, this course is very renowned uh, around uh, the world. And so some of the things they do is a nine week intensive course um, taught in English. Uh, they can get up to 40 uh, participants. Let's add the Institute there and then they have some local activities where you tend to then uh, see some of the uh, conditions being uh, taught. And then in addition, there are clinical rot uh, rotations to uh, different settings around the world uh, where uh, trainees are exposed to some of the conditions, again, that uh, covered during the course. Last, well, I think getting towards the end here, I want to make sure I leave some time for discussion, is uh, a global uh, surgery uh, program. This one is out of neurosurgery, and there is already another growing program out of uh, general surgery with uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, associate chairs uh, responsible for global health being on our steering committee. But it's just an exciting uh, work that's done by uh, one of the neuro pediatric neurosurgeons here who's established uh, relationships in multiple countries, including Vietnam, Kenya, and Ghana. And they, they do uh, three things. They provide service. They provide service around uh, pediatric uh, surgery and then also have a fellow uh, program. And then they do some work around 
virtual presence and augmented reality where they stay here and actually work with people to do operations, do advanced neurosurgery operations after bringing, uh, working with them on some initial training that can remote work with them uh, to do this. It's uh, really uh, uh, amazing. So these are some of the uh, uh, teams. Uh, Dr. Jim uh, Johnston is uh, is leading this uh, collaboration, and this one was in uh, Ghana. And just and very important to document, uh, as we all know, this this work. If it's not published, um, it becomes difficult to leverage that to get funding or do other things that advance the work. So really, nothing is too small to be documented. And you can see. Some of these are actually case reports. Case reports could be a place to start, but um, uh, you know, as one moves forward, uh, more documentation of processes or actual uh, research. And this is an example of a trainee uh, there getting used to the uh, what is it called virtual uh, reality uh, training, and then this is a setup where remotely they are providing uh, support to actually do again neurosurgery uh, uh, training. I would like to point everyone to, oh yeah, this is just, I think making the point here that it's, it's, it, it can be very clear. They have really clear images with the setups uh, that they have, okay? So as you can see somebody from here, um, working with somebody who is in uh, Vietnam and working through uh, surgery and, and providing uh, mentorship. Okay. So just some uh, examples and really clear images of surgery going on. So if you are interested in this, uh, this whole three arm or pronged approach is uh, captured in this initiative called Inner Surgeon that's led again by Dr. Jim Johnston. And you can see at the time this image was captured about 785 members around the world, 41 NGOs, 105 countries, um, you know, uh, involved. So please visit intersurgeon.org to get more information uh, about this. And there may be a, a community here for especially surgeons uh, to be uh, part of. All right, so I talked about Sparkman Center for Global Health, which was out of the School of Public Health. Um, and once the Global Health Initiative that was very vibrant here in the School of Medicine, when I was coming in, uh, uh, you know, sort of went away, Sparkman was the leader. I only mentioned this around to emphasize the politics around global health, right? There are multiple global health um, initiatives that may exist in the same university and having the School of Medicine come up with an institute may create some worries about are you coming to take over? And so they have, we had conversations around uh, common alignments, around different things that we could bring uh, to the table and really agreed on a framework uh, for collaboration and actually signed a memorandum of understanding and because they already had a certificate program in global health, but not a master's, we agreed the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health to jointly uh, offer this uh, master's uh, program. And we've been going, working for a year now, getting all the approvals uh, uh, going on. So collaboration, win-win, um, really uh, crucial and finding that sweet spot is uh, uh, important. And so as we were doing this and looking at global health uh, uh, programs, uh, we uh, got some information that would suggest that in the US, 89 universities offer graduate level global health programs. Uh, most of them are certificate programs, um, small amount a masters, and then a master of global health, very, very few, a master of science in global health, about 16%. And then, uh, you know, outside of the certificate courses, uh, MPH. And there is that confusion between, and people sometimes think global health is public health. It is not. Global health is a discipline that's broader and includes public health as a, um, as a component. So 
pretty much engineering, medicine, et cetera. And so that's the whole transdisciplinary aspect to have huge impact. You got to think beyond just a school of medicine or a school of public health and get partners with different uh, expertise. The other interesting information we had about the US graduate programs is where are they based? So you can see the vast majority uh, based in a school of public health and uh, very few, about 12% or so in a school of medicine. So we will create a situation here where we will share with uh, public health and medicine and perhaps bring in other uh, institutions uh, or, or schools, uh, nursing, et cetera, to be involved in this. So I want to uh, uh, end uh, with this. This is, um, I may, I've not even gone into all the work that we've done in the US because that's irrelevant. Um, well, it's relevant because it's provided that uh, foundation to be able to really uh, move back into global health with the aim to have maximum uh, impact. But uh, Dr. Foresha mentioned at the top uh, that we got a 20 million uh, grant from the American Heart Association. It's what they call their uh, health equity research network. And this one, this is the second one they are putting out. The first one was on hypertension. And the second one is on maternal and infant health disparities because it's perceived uh, that the US has a crisis in this area. And so we put together a network of institutions uh, shown here with the coordinating center, you know, at UAB and uh, got funded to do five projects with us uh, coordinated. So sort of a high risk, uh, high yield opportunity. The turnaround for this was just about three to four months from knowing about it to actually getting it awarded, which is unheard of because something like this for the NIH might take one to one to almost two years if you were doing a resubmission. Uh, but the only reason I, I mentioned this is how we can use global health work to influence even things that we do here and how we can also learn from this setting to in, impact global health. The MMIS project that I mentioned uh, earlier and we are doing in Cameroon is an example of taking from here uh, to over there because it, the MMIS is a trademarked UAB uh, thing where we are able to provide services uh, to remote partners in Alabama. But one of the arguments we made here was to use a WHO model around quality of care. I'm not showing that here to say, think there has to be the quality, there's a quality of care model that we propose in the application, but we also use the WHO mortal delays to ac uh, health access and quality to make the case that there are four delays, traditionally three, delay to seek care, delay to reach help, and the re delay to receive adequate help or quality uh, care. And a lot of things that are uh, involved in that interplay. And then some would say there's a fourth delay in people or the government or society taking responsibility for some of these challenges. So uh, when we proposed to AHA, we really made a strong case around this um, uh, model about community engagement, and social determinants of health, which increasingly are getting uh, more traction, but it's not where we have been in most of the work uh, that we do. And I see that as the, uh, the next uh, frontier. So thank you all for your uh, attention and I hope we have a bit of time um, to uh, have a discussion. Thank you very much, Alan. And uh, that was Re really, really terrific. Um, uh, just, just amazing. Simply amazing. And um, it, it's so much, so much of information, so much of groundbreaking work that uh, UAB yourself, the entire team is doing, and a lot of, lots of learning um, and and sharing. So I think we have we have we have time. We have at least ten minutes or so, and um, I I would invite folks to to pretty much just turn on their mics and 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 go ahead. And I'm sure there are many questions out there. Dr. Tita, this is Austin Dalgo. I'm um, Dennis's uh, uh, partner in our our global health um, efforts here. And so I guess one piece of advice that I'm seeking is given the um, very mature nature of what you do at UAB and our germinal nature of what we're doing here at UT, 
what are what are some of the pieces of advice or steps that you think are important to go from such a, a small enterprise that we've got right now to a more mature program? And one of the things I got from your talk is that it's people. It, it takes a village. Um, but I think uh, that's something that we're uh, really you know, thinking a lot about and would love to get your advice. Yeah, no, uh, really, uh, uh, awesome. thank you. I think that's a really great question. Uh, people here in your setting and also people out in, uh, where you have partnerships, I think um, are crucial and that communication needs to be ongoing to keep people, uh, you know, motivated. This looks mature. Right, but when I look look at what we have been doing, I mean, I, um, uh, you know, as a resident, went to Cameroon and did a survey and published two papers um, in, in in some good journals, and that was a foundation to go back to. Um, and then uh, you know came here and uh, you know started by sending one resident, and then thinking, can we have some structure around this? Can we have our partners also commit to? Some of this. So what I'm saying is that no, there is always a start that may seem small, but it's it's um, you know uh, building and then advocating to get the resources. Like mm -hmm. we got 20, 20 million, and somebody would have thought, well, that was small, but it allowed us to just do some small, small projects that showed a track record of working in that area, and um, that we could collaboratively go uh, to get uh, grants. Now it's looking a bit mature. Why? Because Different people who started small, like I, we did and were in their own different areas, we are bringing them all together into one under one umbrella uh, mm. at the institute to share those resources. And so, if uh, for example you are doing uh, uh, neurosurgery work, and we want to do a research study in pregnancy, well. You have partnerships there. Can we build upon that partnership to find people who would do, uh, we can collaborate with um, on pregnancy? That is seen to be a priority problem uh, there. So I, um, I, I, I would imagine that even there right now, you have people, you may have people who are really engaged and bringing them together may be one way to start broadening uh, that tent if you are not already doing that. Yeah, that's very helpful. That's definitely what we're trying to work on. And, and that's, uh, that's great advice. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Tita. Let me get your thoughts on, on partnerships because um, as you, you, you look back uh, when you did your, your survey uh, last year in um, June, July, um, and you, 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 you went on the listening tour and one of the things that you highlighted was that there were uh, major themes that came out. And uh, one of the themes was the, the whole issue of uh, decolonization equity or so in these partnerships or so. So two questions for you is, um, how is that being integrated, you know, um, currently um, from a UAB standpoint um, regarding taking those uh, recommendations or the themes that came out from, from your listening tour? How is that um, impacting how um, you, you're pursuing programmatic development? That's one. The second question is, um, when you look at partnerships, how, how have you been able to, uh, uh, what lessons have you learned in, in, in grooming partnerships or building partners you know, um, uh, in low and middle income countries? Yeah. Um, so with respect to how the decolonization process is uh, impacting what we do, um, we are really, uh, I'm lucky. One of the things I say is I have an associate director who is just so passionate about that. Um, like everything we do has to be looked at in through that prism of are we uh, promoting decolonization or not? I'll give you an example. We were trying to look at how we prioritize uh, different partner countries. And we were sitting in a steering committee and discuss, discussing this. And we were using the term hubs, like H-U-B-S, just hubs. And somebody just was like, that is not right. That's your, your, your giving the impression that these are just, you know, you're just coming to, um, so we, have, we had to just even at that level of just communication uh, change, uh, the, the terminology and really to acknowledge 
partnerships and we call them partner regions or partner countries um, and use words that uh, you know begin to dispel with that you know we'll just land here and do things um, but but importantly uh, and, and this is more material making sure that when we do things we are advocating for leadership from our partners on the ground and especially looking at the next generation. And so even if it's a pilot grant going on, we want you to show that it will be at some point led by a junior person working with a senior person. I think, um, so we, So everything we do, I think we pause and look at it. Are we, uh, and that's well enshrined, enshrined in our, uh, action plan. Then with respect to just uh, setting up partnerships, um, what have we learned? Um, God, there is there is just so many potential partner. There are just too many potential partnerships. And I think it, it's important to be strategic. Don't turn people off. Um, listen, um, but then have some criteria that everyone knows we're looking at some being some level, having some level of um, covering various missions. So make sure whatever initiative, we won't stop you from doing what you do. We will foster those partnerships. We can have examples of memoranda of understanding to work with. But when it comes to us prioritizing, we want a range of things. Um, and so that allows us to be able to prioritize our energies on things that are in a point to move forward while we allow our faculty and staff who want to have and develop partnerships to continue to do that with a facilitation that we can provide, but making them aware of where we are headed and where they need to be to get priority. Which things we have a couple more minutes, Alan. Uh, one question, uh, my last question to you regarding engagement of medical students in, in this enterprise. Um, uh, how is it out there at UAB? I don't think we're doing enough. I think um, I think we need to do more. There's just a, I think with the coming generation, just so much interest in um, in uh, uh, global health, and uh, we, you know we're getting all these uh, uh, you know requests, etc. And we need to really prioritize. I think that's one area we need to do more on soon uh, because that's great energy. Um, they can really start help start up some. Uh, thing. So yeah, there's a lot of interest, but we need to set up a framework uh, where we are able to have clear opportunities for uh, students. Having the global health uh, degree program will be one. And I'm also engaging. Philanthropy is very important. I'm also engaging in some uh, conversations to have somebody who will provide some significant amount to for us to be dedicated to uh, engaging medical students. Lots of interest. Yes, that's for sure. I mean, here at, 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 at UT, there is significant interest and um, a lot of folks already um, very, very engaged. Well, Alan, I think uh, we, <laughs> we've run out of time. And you know, Dr. Tita, this has been really, really amazing. Um, thank you for the tremendous work that you are doing at, at UAB, the amount of research and the coordination I mean, this in this um, field is um, is simply amazing. We are really honored that you you took the time to to talk with us and share the experiences that you all um, you all have and the opportunities for further collaboration. So, thank you for that. Thank you to our team for making this possible. Um, um, everyone, um, and thanks to your team for helping us coordinate this, Alan. Thank you. Great. Thank you. You all, uh, all have right. a great rest of the week.